So uh, my name is Bernie, born in Brooklyn, went to undergraduate school in aeronautical engineering, went to LA to work in, uh, worked in interplanetary work for um, a while, but had a dual track. I, I uh, got involved in Zen, studied, lived with, at a Zen center with my wife and kids and started teaching. I actually started teaching Zen in 1967, probably before many of you were born. Uh, moved back to New York in 1980. At, at McDonnell Douglas, I got involved in, in uh, I was an era, uh, I had a degree in applied math, PhD in applied math, and got involved, I originally was, like I say, interplanetary work, which is sort of dynamics, but then got involved in uh, software validation. In, in those early days, there was really no way of knowing whether the software had bugs in it or not until they failed. And of course, we were putting software in manned missions and nuclear reactors. So uh, some people had the, you know, the good idea that we should work on figuring out whether the software will work, and especially given different conditions. I mean, there's so many different initial conditions. There. So I got involved in that field uh, uh, for McDonnell Douglas uh, corporate-wide. They had plans in LA and St. Louis. Um, but in 1980, I moved back to uh, New York actually to the Bronx, a place called Riverdale, and started something called the Zen Community of New York. Now, I was born about 75 years ago in Brooklyn to a Jewish socialist family. So in my blood, I had social activism as part of my DNA. And uh, when I moved back, I wanted to uh, teach Zen, but also uh, get involved in social uh, in social action things, and um, I was particularly interested in uh, something that's called a mandala practice of a holistic approach to social action, where you look at five different types of energies. You look at spiritual energy, uh, training energy, social action energy, livelihood energy, and relationship energy, and uh, you try to cover the gamut. I decided to work in homelessness in 1982, and uh, looked at a city called Yonkers, which many of you probably know, it's a little north of here, in Westchester County, right north of the Bronx, and it had the highest per capita homeless rate in the country at that time. And Westchester County was one of the wealthiest counties in the country at that time. So it seemed like an interesting place to look. And, it, and I looked at it holistically. And so we started creating housing. But you needed jobs in order to not have the housing become slums. And seeing, since we were dealing with a lot of single parent families, you needed uh, child care in order for them to be able to work. And then because there's a lot of drugs in the history, you needed dr uh, counseling work and family therapy work. and uh, then I was asked to get involved in AIDS when it first started becoming a, a, a big deal. And uh, so uh, I created housing for folks with AIDS and a health center for HIV positive people. That's all going. It's about 30 years in progress. And it's not as big as Google, but it is doing good work. And uh, we brought some cookies from from the Grayson Bakery, which has an interesting hiring policy. In fact, today they have a, an open hiring. The policy is uh, when they're openings, it's first come, first serve. We don't do any background checks. Uh, so we are hiring a lot of people that have never worked before or their work was dealing drugs. And um, a lot of homeless people, a lot of people with prison records, probably everybody, almost everybody has prison records. But we don't do any checking. And then we break, the, the, the work is done in teams. And of course, everybody in the team, they know each other. They're all from the hood. They, 
So somebody comes into their team and they know the person. And if they, they're paid a certain amount, if they overproduce, if they produce more, they split in the profits. So they have the incentive of teaching the person that's coming into their team to do well. If the person's there just to get enough money to get some drugs next week, then that person won't do well and they will let go of that person. So uh, Zen, Zen Buddha, Buddhism, Zen is just one school of Buddhism. Buddhism is about experiencing the interconnectedness of life. So the folks that we have that we take off the street and start at work, most of them, are, are their connection, their interconnection stops at their own body, at, their, at themselves. Coming through our teamwork, they start seeing the interconnectedness of the group. They may not think of it that way, but they are interested in helping the other people in their group do well because that's, they see that it's, it, it affects them. It, it is them. Do you also get teams where the dynamic works in reverse and everyone on the team is... We haven't. Yeah. I, I, but it's only been going... This teamwork thing has only been in effect since about 1990. So in that short period of history, uh, we have not yet had a case like that. So that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, anyway, having done that work, I, I then uh, uh, am feeling good about it, and I traveled around the world and, and met other people doing wonderful things. So I started getting involved in volunteering in different uh, countries. I, and I, Worked with the Untouchables in India, in Africa, in Rwanda, with uh, the, the uh, sorrow and grief from the 20-year genocide um, in Brazil, in uh, uh, Europe, uh, Sri Lanka, in different places. Uh, about 15 years ago, I moved to Santa Barbara. And I, I, about a year before that, I had seen this movie that I started off with asking about called The Big Lebowski. And I loved the movie. Now, I don't know if you have to be a New York Jew to really love the movie. I don't think so, because it became <laughs> quite a cult movie. And of course, uh, there's only one guy in that movie that's really, that claims to be Jewish, and that's John Good, Goodman, who... Uh, marries a Jew and then, you know, when he's... Anyway, I don't want to spoil it for the two of you who haven't <laughs> seen it. But uh, the dude is a very interesting character and the lines uh, for me were very interesting in that movie. And when I met Jeff Bridges, who plays the dude um, 15 years ago, what I was a little surprised about was that he looked just like the dude <laughs> and acted just like the dude. And in fact, the clothes that he wore in the movie, The Big Lebowski, are his own clothes. That's, he, wear, he dresses like that around the house. And uh, he, he has threatened to, to his wife to to dress like that when he goes doing interviews and whatever. And she says, you can't do it, Jeff. They've been married 35 years. Uh, and he listens to her. But anyway, I was very impressed with the, the lines in the movie. And I, uh, I told them that, you know, the, big, the dude in the movie acts like an enlightened person. For me, enlightenment has to do, everybody is enlightened, but there are depths of enlightenment and enlightenment is a realization of the interconnectedness of life. And as you go deeper and deeper in that, and you find that everything is interconnected, then when things come up, you may go berserk, but not for long. You, you sort of bounce back quicker and quicker as you go deeper and deeper, because you just grok that it's all, it's, it's all one thing, man. So if something is happening, it's, it's, that's what's, both, that's what's happening. What, what are you going to go crazy about it? You're going to work with it. You're going to take those new ingredients and do the best you can, and, and then it keeps going. So he started studying with me Zen. He had already been meditating on his own. 
And we did that for, for, for uh, we've studied, been studying now 15 years. And then about a year and a half ago, uh, I said, you want to do a, a book together? And we went away for four days to a house he has in Montana. And we chatted. And it was all taped, videoed, then transcribed, then edited. And it came out in January as a book called The Dude and the Zen Master. Um, so that's a little uh, flashback on it all. And now I want to open to questions. Some of the more, uh, some of the things that people who know about me want to ask, uh, I'll just throw them out before your questions, is about 25 years ago, uh, before I started getting very heavily involved in doing work for the homeless, I went to live in the streets. And I invited some people to come with me, and uh, about 18 came on that first street retreat, and there have been street retreats happening ever since. And it is now, uh, I started in New York, they, and there are street retreats happening in New York every year, you know? uh, generally in the Bowery is where it start, drift around a little. Uh, now there's street retreats happening uh, around the world, led by different people. Uh, I just did my, probably my last street retreat a year and a half ago. It's uh, getting a little old, uh, and it rained the full. We, that was four days. Most of the re retreats I've done are seven days. Uh, but, uh, that's uh, 18 years ago, I started an annual retreat at Auschwitz. Uh, we, I call them bearing witness retreats. And that one is dealing with the issues of diversity and how we treat others. And so the people as purposely structured so that there are people from many countries, many tr religions, many cultures. There are survivors that come, children of survivors, grandchildren of survivors. There are children and grandchildren of SS people who ran the camps. So it's, there are Palestinians and Israelis that come. There are Native Americans that have come because they want to do a similar retreat in the, in the uh, uh, Black Hills. And uh, Rwandans have come because we, we, we are scheduling for the 20th anniversary of that genocide, a retreat in Rwanda, bringing together the, the Hutus and the Tutsis and the Congo, people from the Congo and Uganda and, uh, and people from Belgium and France that were huge uh, factors in all of that stuff, Germany and Poland. Uh, so those are called bearing witness retreats and um, I talk about all of that kind of stuff in the book. I've written other books. I've written a book called Bearing Witness. And this big model for uh, Grace and the, the model for working with the homeless, I'm trying to replicate that in an Arab city in Israel that would employ Israeli Palestinians, Israeli Jews, and Pal West Bank Palestinians with, that would get work permits because a wall goes through the city that we're planning to put that in. So it's that kind of stuff that I do. Now, questions. So when you run your bakery and you have this process, or no process, like no background checks or no... Um, it's called, we call it open hiring. Open hiring. So what, what is the philosophy behind that? Uh, what is it about those, the checks that happen in a lot of other jobs that you think? Well, it's fear. I, I mean, I think. I think people are afraid of hiring potential violent people or no good people, you know? So it's stereotyping, profiling, and fear, right? I think all of those factors go into it. And uh, uh, Zen is about experiencing things, not holding on to concepts I mean, have a lot of ideas and stuff like that, but not attaching to those. Zen is a, a, a practice of trying to let go of those attachments to be able to see things as they are, not as we think they are. 
so that's what goes into, that is what went into the idea of open hiring, that we were going to go by the experience of how they worked, rather than what their background stuff said they were, and, and what our prototypes were. Um, so for example, you, you know, at, at that time, and, and probably still, m many people have a stereotype that homeless people are no good or they're inferior to others. And in fact, as borne out by if you're on the streets, you'll find that most people seeing us, seeing a homeless person, a street person, will either cross the street or, or divert their eyes. They don't want to look at, you know, there's a lot. Uh, I, I forgot what, um, at my age, you forget what you're talking about. So. <laughs> Have you tried replicating that in other places? Is there something this, special about here that would, uh, would be difficult to replicate elsewhere? No. Uh, as I say, which I'm trying to replicate it now in Israel. Mm. Um, I, it's studied. The model is studied. It's interesting. The model is uh, a, a for-profit, not-for-profit spiritual model. The spirituality of, it, of the model is that as a Zen teacher, when I did this, I was hoping that the people not only would get jobs, but would start interconnecting with others and then with the bigger world. Because that's the role of the Zen teacher, is to help people learn about in, in the, the interconnectedness of life. So the spiritual part, at uh, uh, Grayson as a model, as a not-for-profit, for-profit, and what is called nowadays for the last 10 years probably social entrepreneurship. That is being taught in many business schools, as you know. And Grayson is a model that is studied in many business schools. It's studied at Wharton, at Harvard, at Yale, um, at Columbia, at Stanford. But they, leave, they don't incorporate the spiritual component of it, which if you went to Grayson and you walked in, you would feel you would feel something different going on. Uh, now, we don't have massage rooms, <laughs> but, uh, which I think is a big lack. Yes? Is there any formal meditation training offered? No. Grace well, it's offered, but not... not uh, I mean, there is, a, there is a, a, a Zen meditation hall there. And, in, and now, for example, I come once a month to volunteer or I come, I'm down there once a month, because we have a program which um, uh, uh, my wife and I sort of started, even with Zen students, before bringing it to Grace, and called the Pathmaking Program, which the same holistic model we introduced to your life. So we would sit down and, and talk about what is, what's your interest in terms of spirituality, what's your interest in terms of work, in terms of study, in terms of service in the community, in terms of relationships. And then next year, we, or six months later, we would look how you're doing along those, do you want to ch change your path? And we call it path making. And, and every employee has a path that they set up for themselves with a woman who's in charge of path making work. And Paco here is on the board, and he's co-chair of the path making committee. It's a big piece of what Grayson is about. That comes from the spiritual background. That's not part of the model that's studied, and yet it's a key part of that model. Uh, so there are other, obviously there are other uh, uh, not-for-profit, for-profit integrations, but I don't think there's something quite like grace, that, and there should be, I think, because it works. And it's got 30 years of proof to that. So, so uh, theoretically, it should be duplicated. Uh, you're uh, living with homeless for like seven days and among other people. Do you think this draws attention to uh, homeless awareness? Or no, uh, except for the people that okay. went on it. Uh, so for the people who have been on the street retreat, and now there's thousands, um, 
it changed forever how they would deal with homeless people. Because what do you think is the biggest thing that a person feels when they go to live on the street? I'll tell you what the things are that they think about before they go to live on the street, and you would probably associate. They're concerned about violence, abuse, maybe being raped. They're concerned about being hungry. They're, um, that's probably the biggest concerns. Being what, Ill. huh? Being sick. Being sick. I've never had anybody had their concern, but that, that would be yours. What, what do you think is the biggest thing that they find that has affected them when they're finished? Shame. Huh? Shame. Shame. Yeah, loss of dignity. People not looking at them. They're not, middle class and upper class folks are not so used to people not wanting to look at them, to ignore them. Yeah. And so, from then on, People who have gone on the street tend to ask a, a homeless person, how are you, what's your name? I mean, they'll make contact. It, it's, it's hard not to make contact so when you've... About the, huh? About begging. Yeah, well, we, I, I have certain rules when you come on the streets with me, and, and one of them is uh, that you can't bring any money and uh, that you have to beg. Now, there is enough food to get. Food is not an issue. There's plenty of food in the streets. There's all kinds of ways of it's, a, it's being offered. Bathrooms is a little harder, but uh, and uh, resting is hard. Uh, but I insist on begging because that's uh, something that most people are not so used to. And by very first street retreat, for example, I required that you raise a thousand dollars for every day you came with me on the streets and that you couldn't use your own money and uh, you had to ask friends and relatives or whoever and there was one man who was a very wealthy man who, who came and he said Bernie I just want to pay the five thousand dollars and uh, I said no you can't do that uh, you have to ask. He says, I can't ask my friends for money to go live on the streets. You know, his, all his friends are wealthy friends. Um, but that experience of raising that money initially is the kind of experience you'll, uh, when you go out in the streets and beg. P people think you're crazy or that you, you can't, can't you work, can't you, they have, they think, very negatively of you. Whereas in India, th there could be many holy men that that's how they live their whole life, Prince, through begging. Anyway, begging turns out to be, a, that's what Paco mentioned, it happens to be a, a big factor that changes people. It also gets people to see that they can live in any circumstances that they're not dependent on all of the money they think they need to have. You can live and be very free and live in the moment with, uh, with nothing because you have everything, you know? You have the museums for your art, you have the parks, you have, you have everything. There's all, it's all out there. It's all out here. Yeah. In your experience, can you uh, like stack rank the best ways to reach enlightenment? <laughs> I want to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I defined enlightenment as the experience of the interconnectedness of life. There, there are depths of different degrees of enlightenment. The way you can tell the degree, the depth to which a person has achieved enlightenment is how they serve others. We're all very used to servicing ourselves. 
When you're hungry, you get food. You go to a gym to get in better shape. You get a job to make money, to do things. You may read books about enlightenment or uh, whatever. Uh, we do a lot of things in terms of ourself. That means that you are enlightened to the degree of knowing that you are all interconnected. In fact, you don't even think about it. You act that way. So when you're hungry, your hands bring food to the mouth. If you're bleeding, the hand takes care of what's happening. It doesn't think about whether I should do it or not do it. Some women, when they give birth, don't feel a separation between them and the child. The child sort of does some colicky thing or something, and the mother does something immediately. It's not a discussion of whether to do or not to do. Am I trained enough? Not, you know, you, you. So they are enlightened to the level of them and their child. And with time, they lose that, and the child becomes a separate thing than them. But it could be the same. In, in my experience, the Dalai Lama is serving the world. So the, his degree of enlightenment is to the depth of the world. So you are already enlightened to the degree of, ta of taking care of yourself. Now, from my definition, what would be the easiest way of learning to of deepening that experience, the taking care of others, is to serve others. You can go the other way around. In, in, uh, in the world of Zen, the majority of teaching is teaching that through meditation you will learn. Your attachments will, will fall away and so that you will experience this interconnectedness. I've been a sort of a pioneer in proposing that through self through social action, you can deepen that experience. Which, to me, makes sense when you say it. And, of course, it, you're doing some good things at the same time. Now, I love to sit. I sit every day. It doesn't mean you don't meditate. But I would say that no matter what your life is like, if you can spend some time serving others, that will, will help. That would be my approach. I'm curious about, um, you had mentioned that you were an aeronautical engineer, um, had a career sort of in that field. I'm curious about the transition from that into a very social role. And I, I'm not sure I have a specific question. I'm just interested in how you decided to make that transition, what sort of fears or obstacles you faced, what things turned out to be maybe less problematic than you expected? How, how was that transition for you? For me, it was uh, no sweat, man. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I got interested in Zen in 1958. I was a junior in undergraduate school. Then I got a job, but when in 60, moved to California, was in the aerospace industry. But I was hooked into Zen at that time. Now, when I was, turns out when I was 11, 12, I had started a whole, uh, a book of, of arguments that I came across for and against the existence of God through literature, through science. So some, I was brought up in a socialist family, not a religious family, but somehow I, I had that kind of spiritual bent. Uh, when I went to work, I was already sitting and working. And uh, then I went to Israel, I left after two years of work to go to Israel to, to explore I had read about a spiritual kibbutz there, and I wanted to explore it. Didn't find what I wanted. Israel was too macho for me. And uh, came back, but I met my wife there. And a little after we came back and married, uh, she got involved in, in uh, War Resistance League, uh, helping people stay out of the Vietnam War. 
So our house was, uh, I was working in the aerospace industry and part of the company I was working for was making missiles and stuff and uh, we were working keeping folks out of, uh, uh, keeping folks out of, but some want uh, keeping them out of uh, the draft and working with people. There were people that were part of that movement that wanted to go into the courts to fight the, uh, the system. That, that organization started by a guy named David Harris. I don't know his way. He, he and Joan Baez got married. And these may be all <laughs> old timers. <laughs> having trouble following the uh, <laughs> But at any rate, I had dual lives going. And, uh, and at McDonnell Douglas, I, 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 uh, they knew I was a, a, in Zen and a Zen teacher, and, and it was okay for me to take a week off every month, uh, two hours every day, come in one hour early later and one hour, leave one hour earlier to take off a, a, a week every month to do a retreat. A, um, and then they actually appointed me as sort of the creativity guru for corporate-wide because of my Zen background. So I had these mutual paths and it was never a problem. I mean, it was, uh, it was cool with everybody. It was cool with me. <laughs> I, I didn't have difficulties. Do you still, um, are you still interested in technology and, and engineering and stuff like that, or is one path really dominated now? No. Uh, I'm still interested. It's not as heavy, and, and not in everything. So. I'm interested in new developments in the, in the computer world. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in uh, chaos stuff. Uh, my math wasn't, it was actually, I was before the chaos, but that sort of interested me. Um, so I follow up on some of that kind of. I had a student who was one of the discoverers or one of the original thinkers on string theory. And uh, he died early age of diabetes. They, uh, somehow, this is when I was back in LA, where I did, when I didn't really know. All I knew was it was a new kind of thing. I don't know if any of you know Fritz Kopra. Uh, well, this fellow, Joel and Fritz were very, fr Franz Kopra, or the Fritz, Franz Fritz. Uh, they were very, they worked together at the Bern in Geneva. And uh, Copper wrote a book, uh, and, and Joel had him send it to me for proofread, for comments. So this is way, way back. And then we did a workshop together on Dogen and being time and uh, his new physics. That kind of stuff. I. And uh, yeah, I have general interests. I do not, I, I will have to admit, I do not read Buddhist books. I, they sort of, they, they seem to be repeating the same stuff over and over. So I like new stuff. So at one point you did read them? I read a lot of Buddhist stuff, yes. And then at some point I sort of stopped. It was, felt like it was repetition. Do what do you read? Detective stories. I love <laughs> detective <laughs> stories. Especially Norwegian and uh, Sweden. They have some great writers there. What drew you to Zen as opposed to any? What was that? What drew you to Zen as opposed to any of the other um, schools? I guess I had, uh, I read about it in 1958, first time I heard about it. And uh, it felt like home. Now, what I read about was re talking about the interconnectedness of life and the oneness of life. And uh, most of my experience with religions and other things was really folks separating themselves and talking about how one is better than the other. And that, so there was a certain interest in, in 
in exploring uh, uh, mystical things. And being Jewish, I looked into the Hasidic ways, Kabbalah, and, uh, but the discrimination between men and women was too huge for me. I couldn't, I couldn't get into that. And Buddhism had this appeal to me of uh, we're all interconnected in this. We're all different, but it, it's the kind of thing I've been talking about. That was uh, very appealing to me, and I wanted to experience that because uh, I didn't feel common in, any th in most of the religions of groups. That and then later on, I got very involved in interfaith work, and I read about that kind of thinking in almost every religion. So I've studied. I've been to Catholic monasteries. I've, I've uh, studied Vedanta. Taken. I've taken hand as a Sufi. I've certainly had Jewish training. Uh, and I am a little unusual. I have 40 Dharma successors. That is, there's 40 people that I have empowered to be teachers and teachers. Some of them are Catholic priests. Some of them are Catholic nuns. Some of them are Sufi sheikhs. Some of them are rabbis. So it's a wide range. So it's more like an faith Zen than uh, strictly a Buddhist Zen. Because they still work in those professions. And in fact, the, one of the rabbis, I don't know how many of you here are Jewish, you know Yom Kippur? That it's the holiest day in Judaism, and it's a day of fasting. He leads, a, he's Israeli, he's in his, his family is six generations Israeli. He leads a street retreat on Yom Kippur in the poorest part of Tel Aviv, a very dangerous part of Tel Aviv. So, you, you have... Yeah, well, so when you say that there's this interfaith dialogue in all religions, where do you think that gets lost? Like, where, where do you think, like, you said that when you studied other religions, you did see that sort of divide, but then you also said that you see an interfaith dialogue at the core of a lot of religions. So where do you think that gets well, in, in Buddhism, it's the main, it's the main thrust. I mean, the word Buddha means awakened one, and awakened to what? Awakened to the interconnectedness of life, and we call that experience an enlightenment experience. So all of Buddhism is about that, and there are many schools of Buddhism, and there are different schools saying, answering, trying to answer your question, what's the best way of getting that enlightenment experience and deepening it. There's just many different ways. Uh, visualizations, meditation, chanting. I push social engagement. In the Hindu world, karma yoga is a common thing. Karma yoga is that kind of uh, spiritual life, serving others. We don't have that in Buddhism. We don't have a school that's equivalent to karma yoga. Now there are some in Japan but not yet in this country. And in this country, uh, I'm probably the one that's, my family is called Zen Peacemakers, and there are about 140 Zen Peacemaker groups around the world, and theoretically, they're supposed to be interested in also us helping others. So, but the mainstream of Buddhism was to this interconnectedness of life, in the other traditions, it felt like those were marginalized aspects. They were the mystical, what I, one would say the mystical aspects, but uh, the, the mainstream folks in those religions probably had never heard of, even though we would, might look at them as, uh, and, and some. So for example, in Islam, Rumi, most people have heard of Rumi, and Rumi talks that way. Uh, but yet, it's not quite made mainstream. And, um, you know. That's okay. Uh, so bringing it back to homelessness, can you elaborate on the connection between Zen and homelessness? Can the homeless learn from Zen? Can they become Zen? What's your ultimate <coughs> focus there? Maybe learn anything about the homeless beyond what you've shared already that most people don't really understand. 
Well, one of the fascinating things to me is that uh, once a year, when I was there, so in the early days, once a month, we had a day called Mandala Day, in which we brought everybody together, which meant we had to close the childcare. We had to close all the things we were doing for that day, and we'd bring everybody together. And we had different exercises about the interconnecting each other, and different things. <clears throat> now, uh, once a year, there's something called Mandala Day, and the 170 or 180 people come together, and they have to shut the child care. And, uh, it, it's a big deal. Uh, shut the bakery, and uh, the bakery is making about 10 million a year now, and employing about 80 people. Um, it does the chocolate fudge brownies for Ben and Jerry's chocolate fudge brownie ice cream and yogurt. That's its biggest customer. But it, it does so. buy Ben and Jerry's chocolate fudge ice cream. We're supporting. Exactly, and it says so on the carton. Well, on the carton it says uh, why they Ben and Jerry hooked up, and now I'm close with Ben and Jerry. So we we made that union a long time ago. But they do say why they hooked up with Grayson and what's going on. Uh, what were we talking Oh, yeah. So uh, once a year, there's this Mandala Day. And one year at the Mandala Day, the folks made a mural, a large mural. And on that mural, the themes are interconnectedness of each other, serving the community, it blew me away. If you told me that any Zen group in the country would to draw a mural like that, I would be surprised. That would be wonderful. So here's folks that come from either the homeless ranks or the unemployed ranks or the drug ranks, or, you know, and that's what they came up with. And they came up with themes three important themes for Grayson. They came up with, and the Zen peacemakers, we have three tenets, not knowing, approaching something without attachment to your ideas, being totally open and deep listening. And second, bearing witness, uh, trying to remove the dichotomy, the dualist way of thinking between you and the environment. And then third, out of that, let loving actions arise. So that my, my opinion is that loving actions will arise out of it. They came up with three things. The first being uh, di uh, listen to others. Uh, the, the second is uh, essentially bearing witness. Uh, uh, feel how the others are acting. And the third is serve the community. So I think, for me, the connection is more than uh, clear. Now, they wouldn't call it Buddhist or Zen, but that's something that has, they would not have said 20, 30 years ago, or some, yeah, most of them are not there 20, 30 years. So, it, so I think it's, uh, you know, it's sort of common. I mean, uh, I knew Jonas Salk. And he said that Zen will work because it's like any cell, it's biology. You put a healthy cell into a sick situation. If the cell is really healthy, it will replicate. And the system will become healthy. For me, what's happened at Grayson is a proof of that. It's not so easy to insert healthy cells <laughs> in different places, but uh, it's possible. Everything's possible. What do you think is the kind of the, the largest impediment to our society being more than like an understanding of Being human? Yeah. <laughs> All human beings. You know, I work in so many parts of this world and uh, I don't know. I, I think um, I, I think it's in some way always been the same. People ask me, is it getting better, getting worse? 
and and I think in a, some sense it's a useless question. It's what am I going to do now? What am I going to do? Not whether the system's getting better or worse. What am I going to do? That's the only thing I can get hooked into. Because I don't know if it's getting better or worse. I mean, we worked for so long in the Middle East. If you want to work in frustrating places, um, that can be very, very frustrating. So part of me would say, I can't do that anymore. And then the other part would say, well, you're a quitter, man. Just do your best. Yeah. If you, ha the issue is not to have any expectations. If you have any expectations, you'll have frustrations. If you don't have expectations, how do you? You set goals and you work for them, but don't expect anything to come. You just do all the work. You just work, man. Mm -hmm. But isn't ha setting goals mean having expectations? No, not to me. Uh, you, you could define it that way, so you got to define the words. So for me, I, I, when I started working in Yonkers, I said my goal was I want to end homelessness. I didn't think I was going to end homelessness. But I gave me a direction to steer to. This is what I want to work to do, man. And I'll do my best I can. And if I don't eliminate homelessness, I won't fall apart. If I had an expectation, then I would f probably feel, oh, I screwed up and I didn't do what I had expected to do. But in the meantime, you did a lot. So I look at those goals as uh, points to, to navigate to, but the important thing is the road you're on and what you're doing on that, how you walk in that road. And so, okay, there's, the, there's where I'm going, and maybe I'll make it, maybe I won't. And maybe the point will change by the time I get here or here. I'll think differently, you know. Because the other thing that's a Buddhist opinion is that everything has changed. Nothing stays the same, even one's idea of the goal. That won't change. Did you speak with the Cohen brothers about your, your perspective and, and Jeff Bridges? Do they have any of the same beliefs going into the script writing? Uh, I actually did speak with the Cohen brothers, not before, uh, we, we weren't, bef way before we were going to do the book. And uh, one, one of them said that he knew about Zen, but he had no, it didn't influence, had no influence on the script. And the other one said he knew nothing about Zen and wasn't interested in knowing anything about it. <laughs> uh, but before we, public, before we did the book, Jeff Bridges actually called them to get an okay from them. He said, we're gonna, you know, Bernie and I are gonna do this book, but I don't wanna, in his language, he says, I don't, I don't wanna piss on your carpet. <laughs> so, uh, how do you feel about that? And they said, go for it, man, it sounds great. So that's, uh, but they, they had no you, Buddhist. You had no contact, you had no involvement in the movie. Your involvement came later. Year after I saw the movie. Year after, so. Year after I saw the movie is when I met Jeff, because we moved to Santa Barbara where he was living, and uh, we met, uh, not because in the movie, we met for other reasons. His wife is very involved in homeless work, um, and he was a high school buddy of a woman I know pretty well. Her name is Bonnie Raitt, and uh, she, suggested I meet with him. Um, so. One of the things he said repeatedly about how Zen is about just losing the separation between yourself and the world, the rest of the world, or life, you say. When you say life, do you mean everything, or is everything like a special? No, thing? everything. Uh, do you... <coughs> It, it reminds me of something I've heard of a number of times. In uh, but let me, uh, let me backtrack for one second. It's not between losing the sense of yourself and it's everything. It's, it's what you gain is the experience of yourself as everything. Okay? Because if it's all, you know, if it's all interconnectedness, it's all one. You can't be talking about the self and something outside, you know, set theory. You, you draw a circle. 
<laughs> so you can't have an outside to the circle if the circle is if Do the self. Do you follow anything in like neuroscience and psycho psychology and like more? Um, because I've heard a similar concept come up a number of times when people talk about the brain development and it's yes, one of sure. these I mean, I mean, concepts Jung, at a certain age you don't have Jung, Jung, Jung talks about the, the uh, uh, collective unconsciousness. Th that's the same thing in a sense. It's all, you know. Um, and yeah, there's, I mean, the Dalai Lama has assembled a group, the working mind life group. But there's a lot of work going on nowadays which is saying the same thing in mm -hmm. scientific language. I mean, what I've seen is they've done experiments with children <coughs> and to try and understand mm -hmm. at what age and what brain structures actually um, change when children develop this concept. Uh, below a certain age, they don't have a concept of self versus the rest of the world. And <coughs> this is something that has to develop as the brain develops. You know, you know I haven't done, I haven't kept up, I haven't read. I, there's a lot of work research going on. But I do, it seems to me, now the other thing that I've learned through life is that everything I say is my opinion. And, and people are saying other things, that's their opinions. That's your opinion man, that's my opinion man. And we can no share. Reality, uh, I, I don't think, so. in my opinion, there's no objective reality. <laughs> in my opinion. In my opinion, they're all opinions and we can share and it's, fun. it's great, man. We can share opinions and discuss them and whatever. And once we come up with the notion of objective realities, then we go to war and we get angry and we, all that stuff can't exist if we accept that it's all different opinions, in my opinion. So, uh, so in my opinion, the brain is an instrument, just like the eyes, nose, they're just instruments. And the brain function, the functioning of the brain is thinking. And it thinks in a dualistic way. That's just the way it is. It's just an instrument, man. It's not all of us. There are other ways of experiencing life. So when we experience life using our brain, we're generally, like I see the sun, the brain is saying, oh, that's the sun. Gave it, gave it a label. And then it would say, oh, that's a beautiful sun, or it's a, not as good as the sun. I said, it's, it's, it's not experiencing it directly, it's bringing up concepts. But that's the way it functions. So Zen is about having an experience that's not negating the brain, but not through the brain, a direct experience. Uh, can you imagine experiencing the sun every day anew for the first time? And then later making commentary. Oh, that would sound there. Yeah. The, the other thing that sound, sounds, I don't know, I'm making connections between what you're saying and what, what I've heard. <coughs> um, one of the, 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 at the same time as what I said, like uh, um, uh, uh, the brain developing and constructing this idea of the, the boundaries between me and not me, um, there's also, there finding more and more that this concept that there's a singular stream of consciousness is actually just a construct of how the brain um, constructs a, 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 an ex the experience of the world. And in fact, there is, you can, your brain, you can have multiple thoughts and, and not independently and, and only afterwards try to integrate them into it. So, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm wondering if, if you see everything is connected and everything is, um, uh, if everything's interrelated, then you don't need this, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm not sure how it relates. I'm not sure what my question is. Don't, don't need what? <laughs> Um, if there isn't a singular stream of consciousness that's you, then you're just part of the world and the, and the cosmic consciousness. Um, you're part of that. You're uh, <coughs> so, yeah. Sorry. I'll give you. Uh, I'll give you my opinion on all that. The brain. F f 
obviously, not obviously, in my opinion, the brain, <laughs> the brain is constantly coming up with different thoughts and different ideas and whatever. Those, to me, are opinions. Okay, that's one thing. It's not going to stop. So the, a metaphor for the interconnectedness of life in Buddhism is in one of these sutras. It's called Indra's Net. And it's a net that extends throughout all space and time. So it's a pretty big net. And at, the, at each node, at each node on the net, there's a bright pearl. That bright pearl represents a particular instant of time, time and space. So I'm a bright pearl. Next instant, I'm another bright pearl. So it's all these bright pearls. Every, every thing, the thought of a unicorn, is, that thought is a bright pearl. Every bright pearl is reflected in every other bright pearl. And every other bright pearl is reflected in this bright pearl. And if you shake the net anywhere, the vibrations is felt throughout the whole thing. So that's our metaphor for the interconnectedness of life. Years later, that metaphor came up a long time ago. Years later, somebody stole the word intranet, converted it a little, <laughs> and called it internet. <laughs> and instead of a pearl at every node, they put computers and print, they put all kinds of things. Uh, that's my feeling. The energy of that interconnectedness now is being labeled and felt. And I think Arab Spring is the energy of that, that arose without you, if you ask, how did it arise? Well, people say, oh, it arose because of Facebook or it arose, whatever. But I say it's, it's that kind of energy will keep arising in different things and spreading. So Arab Spring spread to be called different things in different parts of the world. And of course, the internet is a huge manifestation of that kind of energy, of uh, saying how interconnectedness is. And you guys are working on that interkind of, on the fact that there's so much interconnected. You can go from here to there all over the place. That's, at least that's my opinion. So if, if, if you had access to that sort of, all that interconnectedness. We all have access to it. If, if, uh, at, at your disposal, let's say, what would be the most effective thing you could do to increase the sense in which well, that's my job. Yeah, that, that's, that's my job. Is, uh, my job, and my, the vow I made in my job, was to help people experience the interconnectedness of life. So I'm constantly thinking of how to do that. And uh, so there was a time when I was doing that only in the venue of a meditation hall. I, I, that's where I worked. And I decided that the venue should be the world. So then I had to say, well, what does it mean? How do I work in businesses and social engagement and sport, you know? And that's a constant thing. I'm the, that's, that's, that's my profession, is to f try to experiment with that. Uh, for me, it's to get them, well, these bearing witness retreats has been huge. That uh, it's a huge effect on people when they come to those bearing witness retreats. So if you want to get, get a taste, come to those bearing, some of those bearing witness retreats. They're all on our website, zenpeacemakers.org. Um, and then but in some way, that's a little passive. But that's a teaching. If somebody says they want to, they want to study what I'm doing. I say, come to a bearing witness retreat, mm -hmm. and you'll feel it. And then uh, to get deeper, I, I say, get involved, serve in the, your community. 
I also would encourage meditation. I, I, as I say, I meditate every day. But uh, I also know a lot of people that meditate every day that I don't think of doing more than meditating every day. And, and they, they get relaxed, or they feel better. I don't know if it's about just feeling better. Okay, I think I was supposed to end at one, right? At two. Was that true or there was no set? <laughs>